welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Welcome to episode 42 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. So another very interesting episode this week. Um, before I jump into that, I'm just going to quickly touch on the uh, next 20 countries that listen to the podcast outside of the top 20. So numbered 21 to 40. Those countries are in order Hong Kong, Belgium, Italy, Japan, Singapore, Brazil, Portugal, Austria, Puerto Rico, Finland, Indonesia, India, Grenada, Namibia, Greece, Bulgaria, St. Lucia, Chile, Argentina, Poland, and Thailand. So welcome to all of those listeners. Thanks for following the Ocean Sounding Podcast. Now on to this week, uh, this is a third and final episode that's co-hosted by Andy Lamont uh, in his stopover in Panama on his uh, circumnavigation westward bound around the world. And Andy's now uh, well into the Pacific on his final leg to Australia. And he caught up with a gentleman by the name of Paul Ridley, who was um, in the process of leaving Panama and heading to the Galapagos Islands before going on to the Marquesas, Tahiti, and then Australia in the Lagoon 38. So um, part of Paul's interesting background was he got into ocean rowing in 2005, decided uh, that after getting a bit of a taste of it, he'd row across the Atlantic in 2009. Um, That 3,000 nautical mile trip took him 87 days in total. And the interesting thing with that was um, after two weeks of rowing, uh, he'd barely gone 10% of the trip and at times was blown backwards by up to 200 nautical miles in the storms that he struck along the way. So that was uh, 2009. By 2012, he decided he was going to put a team together and row across the Arctic Ocean. It's the only ocean that had never been rowed across before. He did that in 2012 and completed a 1,000 nautical mile trip uh, ac- across 40 days, including some pretty near misses with um, icebergs as well. So um, having had enough of rowing, uh, then uh, Paul took to cruising with his wife and uh, bought a boat in the UK that they've since uh, sailed to Spain, uh, Porto, Lisbon, Canary Islands, Antigua, and the Caribbean. So um, this time he crossed the Atlantic for the very first time by sail as opposed to by rowing. So enjoy this episode uh, with Andy Lamont and uh, Paul Ridley. Uh, I'm going to link to... Paul Ridley as well. His Facebook page is called Sailing Due West. Uh, and I'm also going to link to his Arctic rowing adventure from the oceansailingpodcast.com forward slash podcast um, page as well. So look out for those links on the podcast page. Check out Paul's photos. Follow Paul on Facebook and I'm sure you'll find out some really, really interesting uh, things about Paul and, and his travels and adventures. And, and you'll enjoy the, the photos and videos as well. Just one thing to note at the start of the podcast is a bit of background noise going on, um, and then uh, just a few minutes into the interview, uh, Andy and Paul move to a quiet location and continue the conversation uh, somewhere a lot quieter. So just bear with that a little bit of interference at the start because it will get better as the uh, episode unfolds. Enjoy this week's episode with co-host Andy Lamont uh, talking to Paul Ridley. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm uh, sitting here with uh, Paul Ridley, uh, and I met Paul at the uh, Shelter Bay Yacht Club, uh, and I helped I help Paul go through the Panama Canal just as a line handler, and uh, and I got to know a little bit about him, and it's just amazing the people that you meet, and you know they just look just like normal people, and I found out that Paul had actually uh, had rode uh, across the Atlantic alone, uh, and. Uh, and then done some more rowing in the Arctic Circle, and uh, and now he was uh, taking a, a year or two off work again and, and uh, travelling around, uh, sailed across the Atlantic, and was going to sail through. He's now sailing through to Australia, through the Pacific Islands, in his Lagoon uh, 38. And uh, so we had a great time with Paul going through the through the Panama Canal, and uh, and now I'm just going to ask Paul a few things that didn't let us know some of the fantastic things he's done. And probably starting off, Paul. Um, maybe even before you, 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 you started this uh, uh, 
adventure to row across the Atlantic? What was the in, impetus? What was the idea behind that to make you want to start to do that? Yeah, uh, well, you know, thank you, Andy, for the very kind introduction. <laughs> uh, hopefully, I can live up to live up to the hype. Um, but uh, yeah, so you know, ocean rowing is a is a relatively small community of people that, but but they do exist, right? Yeah. And uh, and I kind of got tapped into the ocean rowing world um, back in 2005 um, when I just graduated from university and. I had spent about six months working in my first real job and realized that actually um, there must be more than this. <laughs> and uh, so I was kind of primed for a new adventure. Um, and I was 22 and didn't know any better. Um, and had a friend at work uh, kind of pull me over one day and said, uh, hey, you got to look at this, this website. You know, there are these guys out there in rowboats rowing across the Atlantic Ocean right now. Um, you know, as we speak, and that was in November 2005. Um, I then went home to my parents' house uh, for Thanksgiving. I'm American, uh, and um, told them that I was planning on rowing across the ocean, right? Um, which they had no reason at all uh, to think I would be able to achieve, or that I would even remember that I said that <laughs> a, few mo- a few months later. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, since then I've I've dragged them uh, on all sorts of. Uh, you know, through all sorts of different um, adventures of mine, and, and they've been supportive the whole time, and uh, you know, and can't be happier about that. Yeah, it's great to have that support group at home, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you do something like that. So, so you told them you were gonna, uh, you thought you were gonna, it was gonna uh, be an adventure to row across the Atlantic, um, and you wanted to row from. Uh, did you have at that time? Did you sort it out your route or? Yeah, well, you have a few different options with rowing the Atlantic. I mean, much like sailing, um, you can go, you can go east to west um, on the traditional sailing route from, the, say, the Canary Islands to the Caribbean, uh, which is what I ended up doing. But uh, boats also go on the North Atlantic uh, from, uh, say, you know, New York City or kind of the northeastern U.S. Uh, uh, west to east um, to. Um, to continental Europe, you know, land in Ireland or the UK or something like that. Um, so one of the first decisions I made was to take the easy way out uh, yes. <laughs> and row, row east to west. Yeah. Not as stupid as you look. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I decided to row from the Canaries to, uh, to the Caribbean. So it was going to be a, a kind of December, you know, January time frame departure. Right, so January departure from from the Canary, yeah, yeah, and um, and so that was how long after you? Yeah, so it took me four years of planning and training and fundraising to um, feel like I was ready to do the trip. Yeah, um, after four years, I felt like I was really ready to do the trip, and I think yeah. I, um, you yeah, know, was had overtrained and you know over prepared. I think yeah. I probably should have left a year earlier, but. Um, you know, <laughs> what can you do? Yeah. So, so um, you, at, the, at the time you, you decided that you wanted to do it, had you actually been in a rowing boat before? Well, so I had uh, been, so I picked up rowing um, in kind of flat water rowing racing yeah. uh, in college, uh, yeah. but I had never rowed before kind of my first year of university. Yeah. Um, and, and in university, I only rowed for two years, so yeah. I wasn't even, you know, I wasn't even a good rower. We were on the, uh, we on the A team, or uh, yeah, yeah, oh, excellent. Um, yeah. But you know, that's as much because I, I'm, you know, six, six feet plus tall, and yeah, yeah. you know, big guy that can pull the oars is, you know, that I had any actually actual skill. Yeah. Um, and so was this in a, a four or a star? Uh, I rowed mostly eights. Eights. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but that's how I got into rowing and rowing. For if you know any rowers or you know have come across them, you, one of the first things you realize is that it's an incredibly culty, obsessive bunch of people. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so once you get into the rowing bubble, it's hard hard to get out, and it's hard yeah. to kind of shake the bug. And um, there's nothing like uh, an ocean row to satisfy <laughs> you know as as much appetite as you could possibly have for rowing. So yeah, but with you, it didn't end there, did it? You actually thought, oh, this was so much fun you'd do it again so <laughs> yeah yeah but tell me um a little bit about the so your first so you never probably owned a, you with this with the age that someone else's boat yeah, yeah? yeah. Uh, and so had you had any type of craft before then or 
Not really. I mean, I, I grew up um, with a family that liked to be on the water, um, yeah. and so we did lots of canoeing and kayaking as kids, okay. um, and we're yeah. kind of around lakes and things, yeah. um, but I, and I was comfortable in a canoe, yeah. uh, but it's a very different, uh, very, different, very different experience, I think, than kind of facing the Atlantic Ocean. Absolutely, <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, I'd never owned a boat, um, had never seen an ocean rowboat in you know, in, in the flesh yeah. um, until I built my own. Oh, so you built your own? Well, so I designed it. Um, you designed it? And, yeah, and then it had a builder um, who, uh, who built it for me, so. So, okay, so this is, so how long into the process did you decide you were going to design your own boat? Yeah, you know, I would have preferred to just buy one. Yeah. But, but there aren't really any ocean rowboats in the U.S. Right. Um, most of the ocean rowers... Um, in the world are in the UK, right? Uh, yeah. And um, it's a long way to go to to go see a boat, and you'd have to deal with shipping it, you know, to the US and then yeah. back again uh, oh. to the Canaries, uh, where I was ultimately going to leave from. So um, the the kind of most practical option was to have it built in the US. Yeah. Um, only problem being, there's no one with any experience um, building uh, ocean rowboats or designing ocean rowboats there. Uh, and even though I didn't have any, at least I was game for it. Yeah. <laughs> so. so you started with a blank sheet of paper, and what did you? So did you uh, design it on CAD or something? Or yes. Yeah, so, well, I mean, I, I took a pencil and paper and said, I, I think the I think these are the specs, right? Right. Okay. Um, so what were you, you know. what did you sort of come up with? Yeah. So so the concept was um, minimal accommodation for a single rower. Right? Yeah. Uh, and. It's a little bit of an oxymoron because the because every rowboat is minimal accommodation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but this was even more minimal. Um, and what I was getting at was that a lot of solo rowers had gone out there um, in boats that are really built for two men, right? Right. Um, yeah. And so they're you know, four or five feet longer than they need to be because they've got an extra rowing position, um, and they can, they're carrying twice as much food as as necessary, and um, you know. All of that, twice as much space, I thought. Right? Yeah. And so the boat that I kind of sketched out was um, rather than 24 feet, which is the typical size for a two-man ocean rowboat. Yeah. Um, I thought I could do it in 19 feet four inches. Yeah. Um, which we did, um, and also you can, you can build a slightly less beamy boat. Yeah. Um, so 19 feet four inches would be about six that's six five, meters. 5.8 meters. 5.8 yeah. meters. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, and I happened to, well, I was able to design the specs such that I, I could just perfectly sit up straight in the, in the uh, aft cabin, which is where um, you sleep and eat. Oh, that sounds like um, luxury. And, you actually get to be able to sit up straight. Yeah, well, if it, on one end of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it ta- tapers down to about a kind of foot high in, in the back. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and so, how did you come at the, the design of the hull shape? Is that just as something you sort of tried to build as streamlined yeah, as possible? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of borrowed it. Um, borrowed it, okay. Yeah, I yeah. kind of borrowed, borrowed the design. Scaled down the 24-footer? Or, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And, and um, when, it, when I took this to the builder, he knew a guy who was, who was willing to do a lot of the, um, the CAD design and um, fluid dynamics and all that kind of right. to make sure that it was going to work yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and so he, he kind of turned it into a real design yeah. um, but you know based on my kind awesome. of layout yeah. uh, and so what, didn't they cut it out with I had it out on a computer and uh, yeah they did they sort of did the laser sections hull sections and things yeah. um, and then they made custom um, custom molds yeah. um, one for the hull uh, oh, they actually made molds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. And and then one for the deck section. So. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. made was it made from any exotic material or? Um, it was it was just um, fiberglass, right? With, yep. a, with a foam core. Foam core. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I ended up finding. Uh, well, I went to all the all the racing yacht builders. Yeah. In, uh, in Newport, Rhode Island, which is where yeah, the, the uh, epicenter. Yeah. 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 And uh, and most of them laughed me out of the room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, because I didn't have any money yeah, right. to pay for the thing, yeah. um, but I did find a, a great boat builder um, uh, called Equidnet Custom Composites, uh, yeah. who kind of had a history of embracing this slightly obscure, quirky, yeah. you know, quirky yeah. kind of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were also building a Chris White 
design um, Ocean 60 catamaran. Oh, no. It's just a beautiful thing. <laughs> and then they had my six meter rowing boat uh, kind of in the, in the shop yeah. at the same time. But um, anyway, so, so they, they sort of really went out on a limb for me. Yeah. Um, and actually the, the, the guys from the Quidneck were in Antigua when I landed. Um, and kind of followed me the whole whole way and supported the trip, and they were really great. So. Awesome, yeah. So, uh, give us an idea of the kind of commitment and financially that that would have been. Yeah. Getting custom making a, a six meter, uh, you know, foam core yeah. vessel with I guess hatches. Yeah. And what what yeah. did it end up? Not yeah. Costing yeah. It? yeah. So um, I paid probably about eighty thousand yeah. US yeah. Um, out of pocket. Yeah. Um, and that didn't include a lot of the materials that the boat builder was able to get donated, right? So all of the, um, all of the glass, all of the foam core, the paint, um, you know, basically everything except the labor and some of the, you know, some of the equipment like the hatches, right? Yeah. You know, it's hard yeah. to, you know, hard, right. hard to find someone to give you those, but um, so you know, it cost probably twice what I ended up paying to actually. You know, to, to build to, it, to yeah. get someone to go build yeah. it from from the yeah. ground up. And you're like a 22, 22. Is that uh, by yeah. this time? Yeah, by the, I was probably twenty four at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, also working a full time job. Yeah. Uh, at the time, uh, and you know, at least trying to, you know, <laughs> to give it you know, hundred yeah. percent effort during the day, and then, um, you know, come home and and sketch out rowboats. Yeah. So. And in, in the lead up to it, was it you know, we did you ever doubt that? that this was a good idea, or were you pretty much fully every day? The, the day got closer, you were more certain it was a great idea. Yeah, I you know I basically started by talking to people who had done it before. Yeah, um, and that that was where a lot of the motivation came from to do the trip. Yeah, um, and you know if I spent enough time talking to people who had done it that they had me convinced that if they had done it, I could too. Yeah. Um, so yeah. As, as long as I didn't, as long as I stuck within that community in the early days, then yeah. it was very encouraging, very positive, um, and really, you know, I didn't have any issues convincing myself that I would at least get to the starting line. Yes. Um, yeah. And yeah. someone and told me, who knows you know, what happens, right? If you get to the starting line, you know, uh, you, you've done more than most, yeah. you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and that's a victory in itself, for right? Just right. getting to the starting line, but... Yeah. You um, so then you you, uh, uh, you you training at the same time. Obviously, you can't train on a like a racing skull because that's going to not give you the yeah. same kind of experience. So, what sort of boat were you training? Yeah, so um, it was so I, I had a rowing coach in my local rowing club. Yeah. Who uh, called Charles Huffmaker, who's a really good guy and a great friend uh, to this day. Who. Uh, on top of his full-time job as a rowing coach, um, also took took me on. Right? Yeah. Um, and he got really into the trip as well, and was calling ocean rowers and asking about their training that they did and what yeah. what was useful and what wasn't, and if you did it all over, what would you do yeah. you know, differently? And uh, and so he got me on on a kind of training plan that was um, yeah, a multi-year plan, right? It was a th- yeah. it was a three-year plan. A three-year plan. Yeah. Wow. Um, and it's like yeah. a, like an Olympic sort of preparation, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. He, the the kind of way he came up with it was he looked at um, he looked at uh, professional triathletes. Yes. And said, okay, you know, if you start with an amateur, um, how long does it take to reach kind of you know Be very competitive. competitive status, right? Yeah. And he what he came up with was that it was three years, right? Yeah. Um, of you know very structured, uh, hard training, um, and we we did have to compromise because I was working and uh, still needed to keep my job to pay for the building of the boat. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, and that would be um, a lot of pressure for a young guy. Yeah. Uh, definitely. I you know I kind of put my reputation on the line uh, when I started talking about doing this trip. And I think in a lot of ways, one of the hardest parts of the whole thing was um, kind of convincing everyone around me that I wasn't just the kind of normal guy who, you know, would like spear every now and then and that kind of thing, uh, and actually was someone who was going to try to pull off 
uh, a, a kind of uh, expedition that's very rarely done and uh, obviously a, quite a big undertaking. Yeah, and by yourself as well. Yeah. Mm. That's the, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so and when you put it out there, you say you're going to do it, then you basically you get to a point where you you've got to make a decision. Either you know I have to do this now, or never not live, be able to live with myself anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, I actually found that once I started talking about it, people it, it kind of built on itself, and so as so when I found someone who kind of supported the idea, they would then. Um, say to their friends, oh, you, you know, you, you should meet my friend Paul who's going to row across the ocean. And then uh, that kind of helped me convince myself that, oh, yeah, I, I was that guy. Yeah, and, yeah. and I am that guy and I am going to do it. And yeah. uh, now, I, having been introduced as the ocean rower guy for years and years, uh, I better actually <laughs> pull it off, right? Yeah. So you told us earlier about your training and how you had this uh, coach. And yeah. uh, So what sort of but did you use or vessel did you use to train in? Yeah, I, I used a big, um, well, relatively big, kind of more stable recreational rowing shell. Okay. Uh, and it was a lot lighter uh, by hundreds and hundreds of pounds um, than my own boat. Uh, but it was it was what I had, and it it was easy to launch, and yeah. so I could I could row that a couple times a day. Uh, whereas my ocean rowboat, uh, when I finally got it in the water needed to be launched on a trailer, uh, which is not easy to do you yeah. know, um, when you only have a couple hours to train. Yeah. So, and, and where were you training? What, you from New York State? Yeah. So, I was living in Connecticut at the time, um, yeah. about an hour outside of New York City, uh, mm -hmm. but on the water, really good rowing community, um, lots of boating going on, and uh, I had a rowing club there that uh, let me keep the boat in their yard, keep my, the, my ocean rowboat. Uh, which was named Liv, uh, in the yard, and uh, I could work on it there. I borrowed the tools from the rowing club, uh, oh, nice. and it was yeah. a really good setup. Well, what was the sea state like there? I guess rowing clubs like to be on this mirror flat surface, right? Yeah, yeah. They, that club was kind of up a river, and so it was a decent surface, um, but pretty tidal. Uh, and you, if you kind of get the tide wrong, which normally, of course, you'd never do um, on purpose, but... Um, I would often, you know, row the wrong way both ways. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to get you know, some yeah, you know, resistance and a right, bit of right. bit of swell and that yeah. type of thing. So, uh, at this point, so you, had you done much rowing in ocean swells or no? Um, ocean rowing isn't isn't the kind of thing. It's not like running a marathon where you train and you kind of work your way up to the distance. Yes. Um, you know, most people, by the time you actually go to run a marathon, which is 26 miles or whatever, most people have already run 22 miles. Yes. Uh, yeah. And ocean rowing, say it's 3,000 miles. The longest uh, stretch I had rowed was probably 100 miles. Uh, yeah. And one overnight because there's nowhere where you can go do a 1,000 mile stretch. Um, yeah. Because either you may as well do the whole thing if right. you can do a 1,000 miles. Yeah. It's kind of like single handed sailing long distances. Yeah. There's no way. Way yeah. to practice it. Right. You've got to be at sea for like months. Yeah. Well, you may as well do the thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and I feel like if everyone uh, knew what it was really going to be like, you know, <laughs> they'd never leave. <laughs> they'd right? ne <laughs> yeah. So fair enough. So you um, uh, so so you've been practicing on the river, uh, and I guess then the date starts. You've got your your new boat delivered, yeah. and. A few overnighters, I guess. And yeah, so so I uh, we finished my my boat um, about a year before uh, I was going to leave, a year before it needed to ship. Um, that was the middle of the winter, um, so I didn't get out on the water much until that spring um, mm -hmm. in my own boat. And you know, these boats are designed uh, to carry all your supplies um, for you know a hundred days, give or take. Um, and uh, not to be rowed you know, into the wind, for example. Um, oh, and yeah. so it's a very difficult boat to train in. Yeah. And uh, so I kind of got on the water in my boat in, say, April of, of uh, the year that I was leaving. I was planning yeah. on leaving in December and trained up until probably August or September in my boat very consistently uh, before I needed to kind of taper my training back uh, to preserve strength for the actual row. Yeah, uh, which ended up uh, starting in January of of uh, two thousand nine. 
So how long was the taper? It was, it was about two and a half months. Two and a half months, yeah. right, where you just start to put on weight. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the challenge there was, was trying to put on fat um, yeah. as much as possible to... to I can eat. give you some help. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and that, nowadays, I'm really good at yeah, it. Yeah. Um, but at, at the time, you know, my metabolism was so high from all the training I'd been doing yeah. uh, that it was really hard uh, to put any weight on. And I was trying to put on 10 pounds uh, to go from uh, 200 pounds, which is kind of my normal training weight, up to about 210. Yeah. So I had a feeling I was going to lose you know, 30 or 40 pounds. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I ended up barely putting on five pounds. Oh, uh, right. After, okay. you know, all of the beer drinking and, you know, Everything. unhealthy food and, you know, in addition to the uh, weight gainer shakes and everything, I mean, it it, it was really difficult. And, and after, it kind of, if you, if you start with a period where I felt you know, the best physically that I ever had in my life, um, then trying to get fat uh, was was really tough and um, felt really different from what I was used to. Yeah, there's like all the women uh, listening to this podcast now just want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of the men too. You're yeah. going like, oh, yeah, trying to get fat. Yeah, yeah well. It's I, just so hard. I, I feel for you, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I lost 40 pounds uh, when I was rowing the Atlantic, but for what it's worth, um, there are a lot easier Easy ways, ways to lose 40 pounds. <laughs> For sure. So, so, uh, so I guess and then the, the big day sort of came. You had to ship the, the, the boat. It was yeah. called Live, was it? Called, like, Live, yeah. Live, yeah. Yeah, Live, L-I-V, um, which uh, my kind of a uh, couple of generations back, my family... Um, came from Norway, uh, yeah. and live is a word in Old Norse uh, for uh, defense and protection. Um, oh, okay. You know, and, yeah. and also life. Yes. Um, so that seemed fitting uh, yeah. you know, for, for my small boat. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the boat shipped from uh, Newark, New Jersey, Port of Newark, uh, in the end of October. Um, yeah. And you can imagine the crunch time that I had leading up to that oh, yeah. uh, to try to get the boat ready. And... I think in a lot of ways, you know, the experience of getting the boat ready um, was similar to um, really the rest of my preparation, which was that once I kind of set out to do this thing, um, you know, even when you least expect it, there are people uh, who show up just at the moment when you need them the most yeah. um, to help the thing come together. And, 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 and what I found too is that uh, some people were just incredibly generous Without any expectation of yeah. anything at all, they just wanted to, you know, support you. you know, yeah. you know, which is, and I was saying uh, to someone else uh, in a previous podcast that it, the best thing about doing something about like this for me was you get to see the best of people, you know, and you don't. It's, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 For example, I was um, I was funding this trip. Um, basically with my paycheck, right? Yeah. Um, and so every time I'd get paid, you know, half of it would go towards the boat and, some, you know, uh, equipment. Yeah. Um, and I had made it until about two weeks before the boat was needing to be in a container. Yeah. Uh, and I was out of money, wasn't going to have another paycheck before the boat needed to ship, uh, and I hadn't bought food. Right. <laughs> Which is expensive, the, that, uh, you know, the dehydrated food yeah. that you took, huh? It, and... Uh, what was that? That was yeah. going to be what another it was going 15, to be, 20? It was going to be $3,000. $3,000, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, and there were all sorts of discounts, and I had found a supplier that was willing to give it to me at wholesale prices and, you know, and ship it for free and all these things. Yeah, but, it's still three um, grand. But yeah. it was still three grand. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, I was um, having chest pains you know, from stress, like, leading up to it, and... You know, waking up having been grinding my teeth all night, and all the you know all of the classic signs of being overly stressed, uh, and just couldn't envision how it was going to come together. Yeah. Um, and I knew that it was going to be really hard, if not impossible, to find that food in the Canary Islands where I was planning on leaving from. Yes, uh, so you had to get it before you. I leave. had to get it before yeah. I left. Um, so, you know, out of nowhere, um, I got a phone call from. Uh, anonymous donor um, or a donor that wanted to be anonymous who said um, you know hey you know, how much do you need right um, they had heard, yeah. heard that I didn't have any food 
uh, and said, you know, there's nothing we'd like to do more than, um, than help you get that food. Yeah, she uh, <laughs> just feel like crying. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, the food made it a couple of days before you know the boat shipped. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, chucked it in there and and uh, and off it went. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's it. And, and uh, it really does just, you know, rest- restore is probably not a good word, but it, it just it bolsters your faith in humanity. Just yeah. think that someone who you never met. Uh, I had met uh, him, but hadn't asked him for money. You know, didn't even know that yeah, they yeah. knew I was looking. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and they just, you know, yeah. And then came yeah. your food, which yeah. is great. Yeah, yeah. And so then, uh, but it, that was a, that's a stressful, stressful time, isn't it? You know, trying to get you know the last. No matter how well you plan it, it's the last few days are nuts, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there's the experience of kind of getting on a plane and booking a one-way ticket and um you know I'll, I'll I'll always remember sitting on on the flight uh overnight flight from New York um I think I was flying to London to connect right yeah and man it's a long flight right yeah. and I was thinking the whole time I gotta row back <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I'm going at 500 miles and this is 500 yeah. miles an hour it feels like a long flight yeah um you know, what could this what could this possibly feel like uh, in a rowboat coming back the other way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, so then you landed in the Canary Islands. Is boat arrived okay? You didn't? Yeah, so yeah, so the boat shipped to Manchester in the UK. Oh, okay, yeah. And then I knew a guy who had a trailer, a British guy who had a trailer that could carry it. And so he took it behind his car from the UK um, across on a ferry across the English Channel to... Um, to France, um, then overland uh, through France and Spain to Cadiz in Spain. Yes. Where yeah. he got another car ferry to go to um, Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Yes. Where he yeah. got on another car ferry to go to the little island of Lago Mero, which is where I actually left from. So, right. Yeah. And but he, and he did all that. Did you go? Did you fly or did you? I flew. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. So, um, yeah. And, yeah. and the boat was there when I got there, and uh, all my food was still in it, and my flares hadn't, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hadn't gone off. And, yeah. You know, yeah. And it was fun. Great. Yeah. So then, um, so and then your uh, I guess family and friends came over to say goodbye. Yeah. And, yeah. So so uh, yeah, my kind of my uh, family and and one friend came over and. Uh, we were planning on having a couple of weeks together um, in uh, on Lago Mera, which is the tiniest, um, uh, quietest Canary Just, Island but, ever. Let me guess, it's the most westward Canary Island. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just about, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, unlike the Canary Islands you know, that most people see with resorts and all the other yeah. things. Um, but it was great, and, and we were planning on having a couple of weeks, and, and I got there, I don't know, 20th of November or something like that, and I was going to leave December 1st, right? Yeah. Uh, and they were going to wave me off of the dock, and it was all going to be great. Um, but uh, it turned out that a few days after I got there, um, a couple uh, Spanish police officers came down to the dock um, with a clipboard and, a, and a, a piece of paper with lots of Spanish on it uh, and uh, wanted me to sign it. Um, and I sort of wasn't going to sign it, but asked around uh, and uh, learned that it was a um, uh, basically a, a statement uh, agreeing uh, where I was intended to agree that they would uh, impound my boat. Oh. Um, and I said, well, I'm not going to, well, I'm obviously not going to agree to that. Why would they do that? Um, and it turned out that the um, Spanish Coast Guard, Salvamento, had exhausted the last of their annual rescue budget on um, going out and picking up a solo sailor who had left from another island um, a week or so before. Uh, And this was now the end of the year. And if they um, had needed to rescue me, they would have been in trouble with the guys in Madrid um, for exceeding their budget. Uh, So so, um, after a lot of back and forth, I kind of realized that I was going to need to you know, agree to whatever they wanted because otherwise you know, they would impound my boat. Um, and the deal was that I had to wait until next year uh, when their, they had new yeah, budget. The budget again. was renewed. Uh, and so I ended up um, just hanging out in uh, La Gomera for all of December. Uh, and I left at 6 a.m. on New Year's Day, wow. <laughs> 2009. Yeah. 
Ah, so that would have been kind of bittersweet in a way, because uh, you know, you when you have the date, it's kind of you know you've got to leave on that day because you've built up to that day, and then all of a sudden you don't have the date anymore. Yeah. And but then after you've sort of relaxed, you've accepted that you're going to wait another month. Was yeah. it, how was that? Was that well? It, it was all right. You know, my parents flew home. Um, yeah. I waved them off, you know, on the ferry, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I spent Christmas and New Year's, uh, you know, in the Canaries on my own. Um, I, I had rented a, um, you know, little, you know, flat uh, there. So I, you know, wasn't staying in a hotel and racking up those bills. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just waited around. Um, you know, nothing you can do. But it was out of the water, obviously, on a trailer. And... Uh, I think I left. I think I left the boat in the water, and I'd go down and, you know, try to find something Keep to do. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I had ages to prepare. Uh, but what that meant was that by the time the big day finally came around, I was ready. Right. Yeah. There was no, you know, oh, I don't, you know, it's going to be tough. I'm not sure I want to do this. It was, you know, oh my God, you yeah, know, let's get out of here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that was kind of a good blessing in a way sometimes, isn't it? Because yeah. you get that extra time. Yeah. And so then you, um, so then 1st of December, 1st of January 2009. Nine. Okay. Yeah. And you, you, uh, you rode out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got in the boat. It was, uh, as I said, New Year's Day. Um, they, the Spanish have, uh, a lot of traditions for celebrating uh, New Year's. Um, yeah. One of them is that they, well, most of the partying starts at midnight, um, not before. So all the restaurants are closed all you know, leading up to midnight. And then at midnight, everyone comes down, the band starts playing in the center of town. Um, I didn't sleep a wink right. uh, the night before uh, because the music was, was you know, just blasting. Yeah. Um, when I, when I was walking down, um, Walking down to my to the boat to leave, there were still people Party. Coming, coming back from the bars, right? Right. Um, in real bad shape. Right. <laughs> and, uh, that would be surreal. Yeah. Um, so it it was it was not the kind of departure that you. No. Imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know the weather was good. Um, I I was more than ready to go. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah yeah I got in the boat and uh, and rode off. Yeah. And so. Um, the first night uneventful. Um, first night, yeah, the the weather was was fine. Um, I do get seasick, and so um, kind of, and I, I would tend tend to be fine when I was in the rowing seat. You could see the horizon, you get a little fresh air. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as I went in the cabin to actually try to get some sleep, you know, you're on you're in a tiny boat on a big sea, uh, and there's no better recipe for seasickness. No. Than that. Yeah. Uh, and. Yeah, I, I climbed into the cabin and realized that um, despite all the preparation, the one thing I'd forgotten was a pillow. Uh, <laughs> After all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I slept on a, you know, on a jacket or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. The whole way across. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, you make the best of it. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you seasick the first night? Uh, yeah, see, I was seasick. I was seasick for the better part of two weeks, probably. Two weeks? Yeah. But you were rowing as well, so... Yeah, but I was, I was rowing 12 hours a day at that point. Right. And so for 12 hours, I felt all right. Uh, right. Other than it, having done a lot of rowing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how was your hydration with the seasickness? Uh, it, it was okay. Yeah. Um, for the first probably four or five days, all I ate was, um, you know, ca like candy, uh, yeah. basically. Yeah. And... Uh, and drank some Gatorade and kind of got got it down. Yeah. Um, but that was it for quite a while, and then you know eventually I upgraded to uh, M and M's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, and then after a couple of weeks you were fine, I guess, as yeah. far as seasickness yeah. went. And uh, but then uh, so so at this time you mostly having your, your um, favorable winds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. The the. the Typical route there is kind of working south um, by four or five hundred miles to get into the trade wind belt, and so yeah. kind of northeast winds um, would help get you there. Yeah. Um, but it meant for the first probably you know, two two three weeks I was going southwest, which was not really getting me much closer to the Caribbean. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a so you used to that's what you had to do. So, yeah. yeah. So. Um, 
So, so you uh, basically, you, weather was fairly, fairly good for you in the first. Yeah, first couple of weeks it was good. Um, the the biggest seas that I saw, the whole trip were day sixteen, uh, yeah. when uh, winds got up to twenty five or thirty overnight, and of course they always they always build to the highest you'll see all day. Um, around sunset, right, yeah. and the few hours after, yeah. when you're the most tired yeah. and most needing to kind of eat and sleep and yeah, you know, yeah, um, get you know get out of you know yeah, get in your cabin and relax a little bit. Um, and the seas had been building all day, building all day, and uh, I had uh, ended up putting my sea anchor out, yeah, uh, which kind of keeps it put, put my bow into the waves. Uh, oh, bow into the waves. Bow into the waves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so that that helps stabilize the boat and gives you a much more comfortable ride. Um, and you just slowly go backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so that that was all right. And you know the next morning it was seas were still huge. Um, and I posted on my on my uh, blog, you know, well this is what's going on. The seas are way too big to row. You know, it was a couple meter, you know, two three meter seas or something, right? And uh, and someone uh, texted me back and said, you know. Sorry, mate. Uh, you better get back out there. Um, this is what you pray for. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you could do fifty miles today if you get out there and row. So, get on with it. Right. Yeah. And you know, and that was that was really useful, um, really valuable uh, kind of message to get because I I took up the sea anchor and rowed and had a good day. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah, we're, we've uh, changed location and we're just sitting in a meeting room in a, in a hotel here. We thought it was going to be quieter, but it's still still a little bit of noise, but that's okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, so you, so then you found you could like do a bit of surfing and yeah, yeah, make some good. So, what sort of mileage per day were you looking at? Yeah, so a good day was well, kind of middle of the road. A good day was forty miles a day. Forty uh, miles, yeah. 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 yeah, and and I could go. It was forty miles made good, right? Yeah. Because I could go straight downwind. Yeah. Um, and but what what you kind of realize is is you get used to ocean rowing and being in a boat is that your job really is to position the boat and manage the boat speed in a way that will help you get the most out of most help from every wave. Yes. Um, yeah. Not necessarily to pull yourself along every inch of the way. Yeah. Um, so if if I could get the boat set up. Um, perfectly for each wave, I could get fifty percent more distance uh, yeah. in terms of surfing. Yeah. And you know, if I if I was off by ten or fifteen degrees of kind of the right spot. Right. And um, so, so you, yeah, a lot of what you're doing on the oars is just turning the boat in the right way. Yeah. Um, so that you can stay on the wave as long as possible and kind of surf diagonally down the face of it as it's as it's passing underneath you. Which except you're facing backwards, right? So well, yeah. So. I'm looking at the oncoming waves, yeah. um, which is really the only useful thing about facing backwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can't see the trough. You can, are you just uh, feeling where the trough is? Well, yeah. no. You, well, you're you're watching. I was watching the oncoming face of the waves. Yeah. Um, and so I could actually, uh, I, I could actually get set up pretty well. Yeah. It was once they were past me, then you know, then then they're gone and forgotten, and you're, I'm on to the next wave. Yeah. Yeah. So. But I spent an awful lot of time uh, watching waves and trying oh, to predict what they were going to do. Fun with it, in, yeah, enjoy, well, yeah, yeah. It's been useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, how far into the trip did you start enjoying? Did you enjoy yourself the first week or two, or did you find you're just sort of surviving and <laughs> kind of going, "I'm just going to get through this kind of feeling"? Yeah. Or yeah, I, I was definitely just surviving. Right? Yeah, and it was one day at a time, and. You know, I had um, kind of hash marks on the wall, yeah. you know, counting the days, and you know, in sets of five, right? Yeah. Um, just like a, if you're in prison. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, and it was a day at a time, and uh, I had, and you come up with lots of tricks for how to kind of stay motivated, and yeah, and because a lot of the challenge of being a being a solo adventurer is that there's no one there to pick you up um, when, no. when you're down, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's easy to kind of let yourself wallow in a yeah. downward spiral of, of misery, no, right? You don't have to like, impress no, anybody. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you do something really good and you can't really tell anybody yeah. how good it was. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, so yeah. So the first couple of weeks was yeah. For, first couple of weeks were were pretty tough, and, and yeah. particularly um, you know, the third week, the seas were big, and you know, I, I was been I'd been out there long enough to feel like I'd been out there a long time. And yeah, I hadn't gone anywhere. Right, right. In, in the grand scheme. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I was probably ten percent of the way. Yeah, um, three weeks, and, and yeah. uh, which is really discouraging. And yeah. You know, I did all sorts of reading, um, you know, books about, you know, from all sorts of adventurers, right? Not just uh, sailors um, in the years leading up to it. And, and one, of the, one of the best stories that turned out to be really useful um, was from a guy, and of course I won't, I won't, I can't remember his name, but um, he was a medical doctor who um, did an expedition with um, Renoff Fines oh, yeah. um, to the South Pole. Uh, yep. And they were, and the, the way he tells the story, they were on skis, um, you know, towing 200 pound sledges behind them with all their food and everything. And, uh, and he'd agreed to do this trip um, you know, with, with you know, one of the world's most famous adventurers. And how could you turn it down? And, uh, and uh, but he, he was a little bit more of a normal guy. And uh, he got out there, and they'd been out there a number of days, and they were having a really bad time, right? Yeah. Um, and and the doctor. Yeah, you know, spent the whole spent a whole day kind of um, in one of those mental troughs, right? Yeah, where he he was just thinking, okay, you know, I know the symptoms of a kind of stroke that I can fake, um, <laughs> where the, you know I can just fall over in the snow. Yeah, um, and there's no permanent you know signs, um, so no one will, they'll never be able to test me and know that I, I was lying that I faked it. Wow! Um, but they'll have to send a helicopter to pick us up. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to fake the stroke, um, you know, and, you know, it'll all be over tonight, you know? Yeah. Uh, and he spent the whole day skiing and feeling guilty about it. And, you know, they had, they got into the tents that night and he, he'd been scheming against his partner basically, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, to do this and end the trip. Um, and he felt so guilty that he finally said, you know, Hey man, I got to admit that I'm in a really bad place and I've been, I've been, uh, you know, planning on faking this stroke. Right? Yeah. Um, and they'd never be able to trace it. Right. Um, and I'm really sorry. And, you know, I, I shouldn't have even For, thought about it. Right. Yeah. And he said, oh, don't worry. I, I've been hoping you had a heart attack <laughs> <laughs> all day. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, at one point after, after one of those bad nights. It's um, a good story to remember. Yeah. 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 I uh, kind of remembering that story called my sister. I yeah. said, hey, you know, believe it or not, I've spent the whole night coming up with trying to come up with a way to get out of this and and, yeah. and preserve my dignity. Yeah. Um, and the best I could do was to break my arm, right? Right. Which I didn't, who knows how I could have broken. It's not easy to break your no. arm, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I said, hey, you know, just so you know, if I if I call you with that <laughs> that line, you know, tell me to get back out there and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go rowing, right? All right. And um, is it your older sister? Or yeah, it's my you? older sister. Nice. And, nice. And, uh, that's all she that's said, cool. all right. And, and I, you know, I basically, you know, as, as he did in that story, you know, you throw that option out the window, right? Yeah. Um, and it yeah, yeah. helps you kind of get on with it. And when you say, when you, when you actually verbalize it, it becomes uh, less yeah. real, doesn't it? Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so um, yeah, so you, so you didn't break your arm? Nope, I didn't. Yeah. Nope. Both arms intact. Uh, yeah, I got back out there, and I think that was that was the turning point for the trip, where I said, you know what, um, enough of this feeling sorry for yourself. Um, yeah. You know, questioning why I made this decision. You know, let's let's get, let's enjoy it. Um, yeah. yeah. And and at that point, um, because it's following seas and following winds, uh, and there's no one out there. Yeah, you know, to help you anyway. Um, the the fastest way home was to row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the fastest way home. Yeah. So you're rowing. No, now you're not rowing to. You're rowing home, or not yeah. rowing away from. Right. You're, yeah. you're rowing home. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a different feeling. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. And and it. You had asked before how long it took to kind of get with the program and. and feel comfortable out there and, and it, I'd say it wasn't until about 40 days in where, 40 days. where I knew I felt like I knew what the boat was capable of and was very confident in the boat yeah um, knew what all the sounds were and what sounds yeah. were normal and what sounds weren't yeah um, I could listen to, to sets of waves coming in at night and approaching the boat and I'd know if 
if I was going to get get smacked or not. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and most of the time, you know, it was fine. But you don't know that in the first few weeks. No, yeah, you don't. Yeah, and um, so you, um, you, how? So after a few weeks, I guess your body started to sort of protest that like this is not normal and uh, yeah, to... yeah. It, it turns out ocean rowing and you know any any kind of long distance adventures are really bad for your body yeah um i had the whole point of my training um leading up to the row was to put my body in a condition where it it could heal. survive you know and heal itself um, yeah. and recover in the first few weeks of the trip yeah um and because because you would never you know you'd never train for this by going out on the weekends and rowing 12 hours a day because um, you just burn through all your muscle and and, uh, and your body would break down. Yeah. Um, so this was about kind of teaching my body to be resilient and heal quickly. Uh, and uh, but even so, you know, it only it doesn't last forever. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the kind of rowing seat was maybe six inches off of the water. Um, so your skin's always wet, you're salty, there's not a lot of fresh water out there to, yeah, yeah. Um, for just kind of basic hygiene. Um, and I, I would kind of shower uh, every night with baby wipes, right? Yeah, And yeah. it would take me six baby wipes and I could clean yeah. myself such as, <laughs> such as you can with baby wipes. Yeah. Uh, but you never get the salt off. And, yeah. and your body, you know, actually sort of in terms of muscles and bones and things, um, I was fi- I was fine really the whole trip, um, but your skin it, is gets very unhappy from yeah, um, yeah. long exposure to um, I can wet and salt. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so um, obviously the the probably the worst part for you would be your your yeah. Yeah, and your, your, yeah, yeah, your hip bones um, where you know, you're not, rowing the rowing kind of motion on a sliding seat, um, yeah. which is which is what I have. Um, you're, you're not staying in one place, right? You're rotating your weight over your hip bones. Uh, yeah. And there, you, know, you, you basically need to put, I had to put all, my whole 200 pounds on two um, three inch diameter um, circles of, of space, right? Yeah. Which is, there's, there's no way to arrange yourself on six square inches um, that, that's not going to bother you after you know, a couple weeks. Yeah. Um, so despite all the padding and everything, I ended up with uh, pressure sores um, oh, man. You know, in places that you don't want to have them. Um, yeah, like yeah. The, the kind of thing that that hospital patients get. Yeah. Um, if they haven't, if they've been in a hospital. So then, too long. then you got these pressure sores right on you. Right. Where you can't see them, I right. guess. You can only feel them. And... Well, you, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Have, thankfully, I didn't have a mirror on board, so that was <laughs> a plus. <laughs> But uh, but they they get pretty nasty and they're kind of open wounds, right? Oh, and so every time weeping sort of wounds, yeah. yeah. And, and every time a wave would come over the boat, then you get salt water steam you know, in, in there, so that doesn't help. Plus, you know, blisters on your hands and feet, um, and uh, you know, exposure to the sun as well. I mean, I I'm very fair skinned, and yeah, and for, so for people of, listening, you're yeah, basically a redhead, so. I, yeah. Yeah. So I, I stayed covered up as much as I could. Yeah. Um, with a you know short sleeve shirt and um, a kind of lycra shorts, but even so, you know it's a lot of sun. And, yeah. And you, you, there's no way to row inside. <laughs> no. So, yeah. yeah. So you so you, um so you um butt was blistered, your hands and yeah. So yeah. And and when, when did that start? How long into it? Uh, it was probably a month in or so, at least. Um, so, so it wasn't wasn't the whole time. Um, yeah. But even you know, even sort of the tops of my legs, um, kind of just above my knee, for example, um, was an area where all of the hair follicles would get infected. Right? So you just start, you just gradually get covered in um, little pimples and little yeah little pimples basically yeah. of irritated hair. Um, which is just disgusting. Yeah, um, yeah. And and there, and nothing heals, right? So, no, that's the worst thing because yeah. it's just always got salt water on it, and it's always yeah. been uh, aggravated. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And and yeah, there was a, a, a dry cabin on the boat, um, which I got wet within the first couple of days because if you're outside in the spray and the salt, 
Um, yeah, and then you crawl into bed, you collapse into bed after a lot of rowing. And, and everything's you know, covered in every, salt. Everything's covered in salt. So yeah. just, and yeah. that just pulls the moisture. Yeah. 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 So um, so after the day thirty, you sort of that must have been pretty challenging, even though you were in a better mental place than you were at the start. Yeah. Now your body started to fall to pieces, and yeah. that's always awful, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it is, and. And there, and there aren't many milestones out there, no. um, which, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I had GPS and was watching my latitude and things. And, uh, you know, you look at your lat long longitude every day and, you know, it would, when I would row, I would be looking at hundredths of a degree uh, uh, and I could move a hundredth of a degree about every 10 strokes. Right? Okay. And yeah. so there is something. Yeah. And, and I would work up to... Um, I would work up to uh, halfway, and I, you know, really spent a lot of time anticipating the halfway mark. Yeah, uh, yeah. and it turned out to be a big mistake uh, because I got, I, I, I was kind of getting hyped up mentally for about a week leading up to the halfway mark. Yeah, and, and I'd been out there, I think, fifty days at that point, and when halfway finally came. Um, it's kind of like, oh, crap, yeah, I'll do this again. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd been out there 50 days and I still had, um, still had a, a thousand, 1,500 miles of rowing to do. Yeah. Um, which, which is just hard to get your head around, right? And the idea of repeating that yeah. uh, was, was just crushing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, since then I don't celebrate halfway. Why? <laughs> Yeah, so you, uh, yeah, so you have fifty days to halfway, but yeah. you did, that included the big sort of dog league yeah. you did to get started heading down south into the trade winds. Yeah, so you knew it wasn't going to be another fifty, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I sure hoped, and you know, it turned out to be eighty-seven days. But you know, even sort of bef before we started talking about finishing. Um, there was a period of a, of a full week, um, starting on day 66, when I got blown backwards right, by two two storms that passed far north of, me, north of me in the North Atlantic, but they mixed up the trade wind pattern. Oh, so you get easily headwinds, yeah. Oh, um, man. going backwards. Going, going backwards, and I lost about 200 miles. 200 was, miles, which, which is five, five days. days. Around. Yeah, yeah. So, and um. You just can't do anything about it when nothing. you're going backwards. Yeah, yeah, nothing. Going backwards into you, you can't row mm. into big seas. No. Yeah. <laughs> How many knots were you talking? Um, uh, in terms of wind. Yeah. Um, oh, maybe twenty. I mean, oh, okay. not, not not a lot. But um, you can't row into but it. the wrong direction. Yeah. No, yeah. 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 So there was not not a prayer of continuing to row. Yeah. And rowing, and I was far enough along that rowing south or north wasn't going to help. Right. So. Yeah. Um, so I just had to sit there and, and there's not a lot of entertainment on board um, as you can imagine um, other than rowing and I sort of woke up every morning had breakfast lay there for a while looked at the sea um, and did the same in the afternoon and repeated that and it was actually a really unusual experience <laughs> uh, to not have anything other than the bare necessities, right? Which was yeah. food, food, water, um, you know, some shelter such as it is. And um, it, in hindsight, it was it made me realize how little you actually need yeah. uh, to survive because it yeah. was down to the real basics. I, not only that, you were just doing nothing to, you were just sitting, like basically getting blown backwards yeah. and you just had to kind of accept yeah. that things will change. That, yeah, yeah that, that at some point it's got to change. Even though, you know, I I had a satellite phone and I'd call a land and call a land and get a quick weather update and they'd say, well, it's going to be a while. You know, I don't know when you might row again. And I got that answer repeatedly for days. Oh man, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, was there a point in that where you were thinking like, I'm going to give this another two weeks? And I I don't think I got to that point. Yeah. I, I I've been out there long enough with the right wind that and. You know, the wind's got to, you know, normalize at some point. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He's saying and, your book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, wow. So, and it, so that was around day. That was day sixty-six, 66. to seventy. You know, 
three or something like that. Okay, so things must have turned around pretty dramatically after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and I was better at it, better at rowing by then. Um, yeah. <laughs> thankfully, it'd be a shame if I wasn't. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so yeah, and, and I think the weather picked up nicely um, after that. Mm. And, um, yeah, and, and I did pick up speed, thankfully. I mean, it, it didn't take me another 50 days to row the second half. Yeah, yeah. So that was good. So in the second half was, you know, what, you heading for Antigua? I, I was heading for Antigua, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the, you know, everyone had told me that the closer you get, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe them. Because um, the beginning was so hard that you said, well, I mean, I think it'll be hard in this. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I did, and I felt like I was over the hump, right? Yeah. Um, but as, as I got closer and closer, I knew that everyone on land was getting more and more excited. Um, and by this time, the, the kind of hype was building and it was in the media and I had done a couple of live interviews with CNN from the water. Yeah. Um, and I, I could tell that there was a lot going on on land and I had more people watching me and all of that. And, um, but every day still was the same. Yeah. Uh, and you know, even the day before um, I landed in Antigua, it's exactly the same as every other day. You don't, yeah. you don't feel any closer. Right? No, uh, yeah. There, there's no... There's no outward sign that you can point to to say, yeah, I'm actually closer, other than yeah, your, your dot on, yeah. on, on a map. Yeah, you yeah. Know, shows that, well, I don't know, maybe you're closer to that other dot. Yeah. Um, and and that, was, that was probably the most isolated I felt because everyone else was excited and was, you know, it felt like the finish was right there. And I didn't. And they were all taking it for granted that, yeah, yeah you're just like rowing home and, yeah. you know. Yeah, so, and then, so, eventually, so, you, you got there? Yeah, yeah, eventually, <laughs> eventually I got there, um, yeah, March 31st of 2000, uh, 2009, I got there, Yeah. yeah. Um, and having, having missed all sorts of things, you know, all sorts of crazy things I learned, uh, let's see, Twitter had become a thing um, <laughs> in that period. I'd never heard of Twitter, and I got home, and my dad said, oh, there's this new thing called Twitter. Right. Um, yeah. You know, you got to, I've yeah. opened an account for you, and you've been yeah. tweeting, right? <laughs> um, you know, Obama, Obama had been inaugurated. Um, yeah. And there was an American Airlines pilot who had hit a bunch of geese and landed his plane in the Hudson River. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you know, all of that, well. right? Yeah. Uh, and so there was catching up on all that. Um, but, uh, so I was out there quite a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, but yeah, day eighty seven um, landed in English Harbor. Uh, yeah, Antigua. yeah. And, uh, well, that would have been a great feeling. Huh? It was a big welcome home for you. Yeah, Lots yeah. It, it 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 was fantastic. I mean, yeah. Um, you know, it it was uh, everything that I had been missing and yeah, dreaming of from people to food to drink to yeah, you know, just a dry bed. You know, it's, yeah, it's all handed to you all at once. Yeah, you know, and. Um, and and it was fantastic, uh, and you know the I got my first taste of um, sort of media frenzy uh, because we'd been very lucky and had um, had a couple of news outlets pick it up, um, but I I was you know ushered off to um, do a phone interview um, with CNN within ten minutes of stepping foot on land because right. they wanted to be yeah. you know the first right. Um, and you know that was the beginning of a of a kind of whirlwind, uh, kind of four to six weeks where um, where the story was out there. Yeah, yeah. So, and that was that was an experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I bet you. Yeah. So yeah, you you went on the what went on, national shows yeah, and went on yeah kind of the you know, the morning shows you know in New York. Um, you know, did that. Um, Night shows flew, too. Flew to, flew to L.A. and did. Um, you know, like a kind of night talk show. Yeah. Um, they did radio call-ins, you know, did uh, did all the news. And how, did you, how was your body recovering? Right? Um, yeah, it was all right. I mean, I, I was eating a lot. Yeah. You know, and your skin was amount. coming back? Yeah, your skin, your skin comes back really quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, I kept, I, but I kept the beard because I was still, if I was doing media stuff, you know, they don't want you to show up looking clean cut, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. like you just, you know, got out of work, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, uh, so I had this gnarly beard um, yeah. for for quite a while, but, 
yeah, I mean, I, I would go and catch up with friends and, and forget to talk to them because I, I was so busy eating, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and they just let me go for it for yeah. 10 minutes, you know. And then, cool. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, and yeah. Put, put, some, put a lot of weight back on, yeah. and, you know, yeah. relatively quickly, and it was great fun. And so then after that, you did, did another rowing trip. Yeah, I did. I mean, when I, uh, after the Atlantic, it had been enough of an experience that, and uh, it was successful and, you know, in, in every, every way I could have hoped. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we also raised a bunch of money for cancer research. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was a big personal achievement for a good cause that had, you know, people following it that inspired yeah. Um, you know, classrooms to follow me and, you know, ask questions about the fish while I was out there yeah. and that kind of thing. And it was just really positive. Um, and said, well, can't get any better than this. Um, yeah. You know, I'm done done with rowing. You know, yeah. You can't, can't beat solo, um, you know, unsupported uh, nonstop. Uh, yeah. The Atlantic, right? so, yeah. Um, so I retired right, from, from ocean rowing. Uh, the, the problem was that, um, that I'd like a project. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and... You know, that, that was a good four years of project for me. And, and um, after a year or two, I was kind of looking at, looking at the next thing um, and came across the, well, it was on the, the main website of the Ocean Rowing Society, which is the sort of little pretty informal group where they keep track of the records, right? Yeah. The times and who's done it and all that. Uh, and uh, turns out that there was one ocean left that hadn't been rowed, uh, and it was the Arctic. Um, so I kind of sketched out some plans and looked at the weather and thought, well, I'm actually, yeah, I'm, I'm actually kind of well, relatively well placed to do this. And it seems like no one's been dumb enough to, to try it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so then, then I said, well, this is actually a terrible idea. Um, you know, the Atlantic, uh, you know, was, was enough of a pain. Um, and so I kind of put the, put the idea on the shelf, the plans on the shelf and said, well, you know, maybe one day I'll come back to it. Um, but it turns out I, I met, a, met a guy who had heard about my rowing experience um, and was a national champion uh, adventure racer in the yeah. U.S., right? So he, the kind of thing where, you, you know, they send you with a compass off up, you know, across a mountain range and then you, you know, kayak down the river and then you cycle back up the mountain yeah. and then you run around the woods for a while. Anyway, he was pretty good at that uh, and uh, really incredibly energetic guy um, who could convince you to do anything um, and he convinced me that I should dust off those plans for the Arctic um, and go rowing with him right. um, and uh, yeah, which turns out we did um, and uh, did an expedition in 2012 um, where, uh, where we and uh, two other guys, it was a four man team um, were the first uh, to row the Arctic Ocean um, non-stop and unsupported, uh, which we did, we, where we covered a uh, thousand miles, a little over a thousand miles from Inuvik in the Northwest ter Territories of Canada yeah. uh, to a little um, native uh, First Nations village called Point Hope uh, on the western tip of Alaska. Right. So, And you were telling me about that was uh, a whole different level of experiences. You were in a storm there with four people inside the the yeah. sleeping area, which is only meant for two. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, that boat was 26 feet, I believe. 26 yeah. feet, yeah. four, four 200 pound men. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was the smallest guy. I'm 6'2, 200 pounds, which is nine, what is it, 91 kilos? Right? 91 kilos. Um, I'm not, not, usually not the smallest guy in the room. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I was, I was by probably 30 pounds and at least a couple inches the smallest guy on that crew. <laughs> Um, so tell me again. Yeah. So, four uh, men. Yeah. The boat's twenty-four foot, twenty-six feet, twenty-six foot long, yeah. uh, and uh, and you're the smallest one. You're ninety-one kilos. Yeah. The others are like football players yeah. or something. They're big yeah. guys. Yeah. 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 And I didn't. Uh, I didn't want to be the biggest and strongest guy on the boat. I mean, I at least recruited guys who could <laughs> row me around. Yeah, right. <laughs> but then. Uh, and so there's sleeping for two. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so there are two rowing positions yeah. um, outside. Yeah. And so the, the idea is, is two, two on, two off. This boat rows um, 24 and, hours a day. And the boat moves 24 hours a yeah. day. 
And you're doing what, two hours on, two hours off? Yeah, we started with two on, two off, and we experimented a little bit, landed at three on, three off, um, which was long enough to feel like you could sleep yep. when, when you're not on shift. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Every boat does it differently. But, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but the main kind of the main thing is that the design of the boat um, is based on the fact that two guys have to be outside all the time rowing. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. And with, what about the, the weight factor? Of the boat? Was it designed to carry that, you know? Yeah. 500 yeah. kilos of men ish <laughs> yeah. so so yeah so then then so it's designed so the two guys can row two guys can sleep yeah. then you get a uh what yeah you got some wind didn't you yeah. up there yeah so on, on a traditional trade wind route like across the atlantic which yeah. is what this boat was built to do yeah uh, and it had been across the atlantic a couple times before so it was a proven design proven boat um you know there's no reason to think that you wouldn't be able to have two guys outside all the time right? yeah because uh, it's a trade wind route and relatively predictable um, but the arctic is not that way no um, yeah and so uh, we found ourselves for uh, probably about probably two weeks um in a couple different stretches um being holed up in the boat um all four of us in, so in, what, in what, is, what sort of you talking about like, you got yeah so we're talking 30 knot winds from the wrong direction and, yeah. uh, and pack ice um, being blown towards you and right. where it's not supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, and so the challenge up there is is not as much the waves, um, the you know, big swell as you'd have on, on the Atlantic or Pacific, yeah. um, but it's the ice um, and yeah. how much there is and, and where, it's, where, where it is um, because, because the ice is blown around by the wind yeah. Um, and if the wind's blowing in the right direction, then you'll know where the ice is going to be. But if you get a reversal of the wind direction, then you can have ice, um, you know, on your route, right? And you need to kind of wait. What what we did was tried to time it uh, such that we uh, left late enough that the way would be clear, because otherwise, in that part of the world. It's iced in, and there's no nowhere to cross with open water, right? Um, north of Alaska, right? Um, so, yeah. we needed to get lucky on the weather that year, uh, because some years it never melts out. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also had to be in the narrowest section where you're going to have the least ice um, at the time when it's going to be clear when you get there, right? Because right. if you wait until it's clear and then you leave, then it's going to be closed. Will, then it'll be closed again by the time you get there. Right. right. Yeah. And so you got to leave expecting the weather to help you out and while you're on your. There's way. a fair bit of risk here too. I mean, if you get iced in, you know, you have to start uh, looking yeah. at how you survive, right? Right. Yeah, and you can get into a very tricky situation. Yeah. Um, very quickly, um, but uh, you know both. From the ice, uh, yeah, and what it would do to a fiberglass boat, mm -hmm. um, which you know, this this was a boat that was, yeah, I don't know, maybe three quarter inch foam with a couple layers of fiberglass on either side, yeah, uh, maybe half inch foam, and uh, and that's it. And it was designed for warm weather rowing, uh, and if you run into a chunk of ice, even a small one, um, you know, let alone get um, it's surrounded by pack ice, yeah. um, then you're going to be in big trouble. Um, and not only that, you, you, know, you could lose your boat or um, have your boat up on the ice um, where uh, there are polar bears. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> hungry polar bears. <laughs> wow. um, and we, you know, we, we did have a 12 gauge shotgun on board. Yeah. Um, but uh, obviously, no one wants to. No one, no one wants to use it. So. Yeah, and it's got to work too. Yeah. And, you know, like yeah, you know, twelve gauge shotgun that's been sitting in a boat for a while might not yeah. actually. So, yeah. so you, so, so you basically, when you've got a reversal of wind, now it's, you, the two guys can sit out there, but they're rowing going nowhere. Right. Or yeah, yeah, and so so when that happened, we spent quite a lot of time. Um, well, we, so for, first thing we did was go closer to shore, right? Um, yeah. Where if we got into a point where we're looking at getting crushed by the ice, um, we, you could go ashore. Um, it would be the end of our trip. Yeah. Um, but hopefully yeah, someone could come pick you up. We'd be yeah. safe, yeah. Um, and we'd probably lose the boat at that point, too. Yes. Yeah. There's no way to get a boat out. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, in remote, you know, Canada or Alaska. 
Um, so we went closer to shore, um, tried rowing. Um, we were making, we, we spent a few days making less than a knot, uh, which is a lot tougher when you have landmarks that, you, that you're looking at. When, uh, yeah. you know, you've been looking at that same rock for an hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> So we we tried to row into it for quite a while, uh, and then eventually. How was morale this time? Brutal, brutal, I mean, just yeah. brutal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, anyway, we finally said, "Look, you, this is making no sense." And the, the weather was looking worse and worse, and and there was a big, um, a big area of pack ice that was coming yeah. in, coming in towards us, uh, and so we ended up rowing backwards for about a day. Uh, to get back around, this we were we were pretty close to Barrow, Alaska, which is the northernmost point in the United States. Yeah, um, and so we had crossed this big milestone of crossing the northernmost tip of the U.S. Yeah. and we started to turn southwest. And was it there? Was there was a China command in the boat? There was a, a yeah. Captain or? Well, there was. Um, it in hindsight, it I had left it more democratic than I wished. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, but. Um, I was the only experienced ocean rower on board, um, and we had agreed that that you know I would have the last the last call. Yeah. Um, but as you can imagine, you know any group of guys that are going to get in a boat and do this, you know you've got some big personalities. Yes, of course. This, these and, are not like people that are going to be yeah. kind of like oh well I'll just defer to your opinion. Yeah. Be, yeah, yeah. We had two guys that had, had somebody at Everest. Um, right. You know. <laughs> A national champion adventure racer, you know, myself. Um, yeah. so, and you're like doing one knot looking at the same rock yeah. and someone's going, whose idea was this? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so it, it, it was tough. Yeah. Um, it was really tough. It was, it was not the military chain of command, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so we spent a lot of time um, trying to get everyone, um, you know, everyone on board with the idea. And, and uh, you're never all the way there. And then, but you got four guys also sleeping in a uh, two-man yeah. compartment. Yep. Yeah. yeah. In someone farts or something, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all hell breaks loose. Does yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. We, uh, how, how we ended up doing it? We spent quite a lot of time with the four of us in this small space. And to give you an idea, with the, with the hat shut or. Oh yeah, hatches closed. Oh all the time, god, you know? right. I mean, you could open them and get some fresh air in, um, mm -hmm. but, but you're, you're so close to the water that you know there's spray and and salt. And if you know if you get a wave in in, in your hatch, um, it takes a miserable situation. And, the, and then you got the same deal where everyone's sort of doing like a six baby wipe shower or something. And you would hope. <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you never know. Yeah. I also had a hell of a time getting the guys to to pee downwind. Raw upwind, um, and to this day, I'm still not sure what they were getting at. But the argument this was a big debate on the boat um, was that if you pee into the wind, then you can look into the wind and see the waves coming, right? So you can help to balance yourself, yeah. And so they would, all, you covered in, the, you're covered in, you're covered in pee, then right? you crawl back into the like cuddle up to your yeah. best friend, no yeah. thanks, yeah, right, okay, so. Anyway, things like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the, the, this argument here is kind of like, it's kind of an academic argument about which is the best way to pee and really no one's really invested in the outcome. But if you've got to like spend like a, a week next to someone covered in stale urine, I guess it's a different story. Yeah, it, and we had bigger worries at the time, amazingly. But um, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a unique experience to be in physical contact yeah. with at least two other men um, nonstop for a week. Yeah. And, uh, and without, you know, without sort of casting aspersions on anyone, it's kind of beyond what anybody can do unless they have that really strict discipline. You know, it, 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 it must have yeah. just been only in only in situations that are unplanned. You know, not going the way that you thought they were going to go. Would yeah. anyone do this, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, in in all in both of these trips, um, it's easy to feel sorry for yourself. Um, yeah. But it, it's also important that um, 
we also, that we also stay grounded and say, look, you know, we all chose to be here, right? There, yeah. there are people in a lot worse situations than this. Yeah. You know, in, in prison or at, at war or something. I mean, exactly. You know, we've, yeah. we've got it, we've got it pretty easy, and and you know, we did this with our eyes mm-hmm. open, right? Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. So wow. So anyway, did it eventually it actually happened, right? That you actually uh, completed the the journey. Yeah, uh, yeah, we did. We uh, we landed in in Point Hope, Alaska, um, in August um, a- after waiting for quite a while to see if the weather would turn uh, and allow us to continue and go for even further. Um, yeah, but it it was the end of August and. Um, and winter was coming, right? and so you know the, the seasons were changing, and it was right. clear that um, that the what the bad weather that we winter were is, waiting winter on is coming actually was, really meant something. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the weather was not going to change um, yeah. for a season, and uh, and so it was pretty clear that that was going to be the end of the trip. Yeah, uh, which was fine, uh, yeah. and you know we were ready to go. We we wanted to get as much out of it as we possibly could, and row for as long as we could, and sort of set the mark. Yeah. Uh, and you know as good a place as we as, as was possible um and and we did uh and you know i think you know we've all been happy with with the trip and uh and the outcome and you know we kind of came back to um to you know lots of praise and things that you get from this and yeah. you know the guinness book and all those other things so i guess you learned in that trip that it's if you're going to go ocean sailing or ocean traveling with someone as a beautiful woman is much better than <laughs> like three big yeah. guys right yeah yeah, yeah yeah definitely which brings us to you know uh how i met you uh and you know what the point of this podcast is ocean sailing so we've been talking a lot about rowing but it's so fascinating but then um you know you're now um uh traveling around the world uh, in a really comfortable, beautiful boat with a you know a beautiful woman, and uh, it's a whole different ball game right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So how did that get started? So you finished that um, Arctic trip. Yeah. Uh, Say goodbye to all your smelly mates, and uh, uh, and then you went. Obviously, you went back to work. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I went back to work. I mean, the thing about these trips is they. Uh, they leave me with a lot of bills to pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I went back to work um, for a couple of years, and, and but at that point, um, I, I was pretty comfortable on the ocean. Uh, yeah. I'd been 128 days at sea. Yeah. Uh, and pretty self sufficient, very self sufficient, uh, and uh, felt like I knew what was out there. Um, I, I had also, when I was getting ready to row the Atlantic, uh, spent a lot of time in a marina. Um, I would happen to be on a pontoon uh, that was right next to the ramp, you know, and yeah. it was right next to the, the grocery store. Um, and I and I, I trace a lot of the kind of motivation or the origin of her, my kind of sailing trip now to the experience of sitting in my 19-foot boat um, watching the sailors provision. Um, <laughs> and, and they would come down the dock with cases of wine, <laughs> you know, fresh vegetables, you yeah. know, just everything you could ever yeah, want. Um, right. this is smart. And yeah. I thought to myself at that time, you know what, one day I'm going to do this uh, the, yeah. e- the easy way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and let's see, December 2nd, uh, 2016, um, my girlfriend Jenny and I uh, left the same marina um, in the Canaries. Oh, the uh, same marina? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. On uh, on this trip. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, um, and that was a, a a good trip across. So you, you ended up cho- choosing a a catamaran. Yeah. Um, which is a you know a beautiful boat and uh, it's lots of room and yeah, nice and comfy and yeah. sails well. Yeah. Downwind I, especially. Right. Yeah. I I did want to do it the easy way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, and you know big cruising catamaran uh, is. Yeah, it it helps, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And we've got loads of space. I mean, we lived in London, central London, um, before we uh, left our jobs and went on this trip. Um, but we have more space on the boat, you know, now than we did in, in our flat in central London. Is that amazing? Um, yeah. yeah, which is incredible. But, yeah. um, but basically, I, uh, you know, I think that we 
both were ready for a trip uh, like this. We, I'd probably, I'd worked five years since since my last trip. Oh yeah, and, five years uh, is a long time to work. Right? And yeah, it's a really long time to work. It was terrible, but um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, but yeah. you know, neither one of us knew anything about sailing, even though I, I was pretty sure that you know I could, I, I'd, yeah. I'd be okay. Yeah. Uh, at sea, and so we did a week of sailing courses. Um, bought a boat. Um, with one week of sailing experience, mm -hmm. but, um, and uh, and kind of slept around the UK for a while trying to figure it all out, mm -hmm. um, and then a year later, um, I, we started moving the boat um, down from the UK from Portsmouth uh, in June of uh, June twenty sixteen, June last year. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and quickly you've, you've gone from uh, UK. Uh, and where, where was your first yep. port of call? Uh, yeah, uh, so Portsmouth, um, west out the English Channel, uh, then south across the Bay of Biscay to Corunna, yeah. on the north coast of Spain. Uh -huh. um, and it's just as rainy and cloudy and cold as England. Um, around, uh, around Cape Finisterre, down to uh, Porto and Lisbon. Yeah. Um, then Lisbon to the Canaries, uh, uh, Canaries um, the island of La Gomera, to Antigua. Mm -hmm. um, up and down the Caribbean north as far as uh, St. Martin and South yeah. to so, so it was a, a, pretty much a, a, a duplication of your trip from the Canaries to Antigua? Same exact route, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. You must have got just bored doing a crazy going, when I was at this yeah. point, I was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 You think this is hard? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a, a so awesome. So you did the same trip. How many days did that take? Now twenty two days. Twenty two days instead of eighty seven. Yeah. yeah, awesome. And, uh, and then you got to Antigua and 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 basically what just hopped all the way down through the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah I got to Antigua and uh, the slip they assigned assigned us in um, the marina, kind of along the seawall there, was the same exact spot that I had rode my, my no. boat into with, within inches right? really? uh, years before. Yeah, of all the open spots, that was the one they gave us. It's not amazing. Um, which yeah. is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so we spent um, a few months working our way up and down in the Caribbean, um, kind of hit all the, you know, a lot of the big spots. Um, yeah. And then uh, from Grenada turned west to, um, to Bonaire, um, did uh, Cartagena, uh, Colombia for a few days, and then uh, San Blas Islands in Panama uh, to Shelter Bay Marina um, at the on the Atlantic side of the Panama Canal. Where, yeah, where we met you. and now we're sitting here in uh, Panama City. Uh, so, and your next uh, your next destinations are um, well, you're going to stay here for a little while, obviously, yeah. and then um, then you're going to head to uh, Galapagos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Galapagos to. Um, and we'll spend a couple of weeks in the Galapagos, um, and then move on to the Marquesas, yeah. um, you know, Tahiti and, and beyond. So yeah. eventually, I'm hoping to get to Australia um, this season. So yeah, and anyone listening in Australia, uh, you're going to be selling about we in will. Australia. So uh, and uh, so you might find that uh, by the time you get there, the people listen to this and go. She's with mine on Lagoon 38. So, yeah, so that could be good, yeah. Um, but uh, look, uh, what a trip. What, and how old are you now? I am 33. 33. Goodness me. And, like, do you think to think that, you know, like at 33 you've got, you know, 50 or 60 more years? I mean, just speaking to John Sanders on his 10th circumnavigation in uh, Shelter Bay there, and, and uh, he's 78. I mean, like, what are you going to do? How are you going to sort of, like, enjoy the rest of your life? You've done everything. So it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Have you got any plans, like any other things that are, you know, sort of bubbling away under the surface that, you know, you haven't yeah. told anyone about yet? Or? Well, there's, there's always something. I mean, you know, I've, I've spent some time on mountains and things. Um, I thought flying sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there's there are loads of options out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the best way to come up with my next trip has been to go back to work for a while. Um, and you know, get hit by get, get, yeah, yeah. Live, live kind of real life for um, a couple of years and then work another then, couple of years. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah, even pay five. the bills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, then before you know it, there, something will come up. Something will come up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. Um, 
Uh, it's been really great to talk to you and, and such a privilege to meet you. And, and it, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it was totally unexpected. You know, I just thought, oh, these people on a catamaran, you know, a boyfriend, a husband and wife or, or, or partners. Uh, and to find out, you know, like what an awesome history you guys have had. Uh, it's been great. And Jen, Jenny's been, this is her first a sailing experience. Yeah. And she's really at home on the boat, isn't she? Yeah. And uh, so it's been great to talk to you. And um, I'm sure you have some photos and that that uh, people can see and some links to your websites. Yeah. Uh, um, anything you want to sort of add? Yeah, before? yeah, sure. So um, you know, all of the kind of archive stuff from my Atlantic rowing trip um, is online at rowforhope.com. Yeah. Um, uh, and let's see, the Arctic is uh, is still there. You know, videos and um, and pictures and things on ArcticRow.com. Yeah. Um, creatively named. Uh, and uh, and if you want to follow our uh, current our, us today, kind of on our current sailing trip, it's uh, sailing due west. Our name of the boat is Due West, and it's uh, if you Google sailing due west, you'll find Facebook, Instagram. Um, and maybe we will have actually put something on sailingdewest.com yeah. by the time this makes it anywhere. Right. All right. Thanks, man. All right. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. Thanks for joining me this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. I publish the Ocean Sailing Podcast to share interesting stories about ordinary people doing extraordinary things from a sailing point of view, whether that's uh, racing locally, coastal cruising, or or sailing around the world. So if you've got a great story, you've got something you'd like to share, or you know of somebody I can interview, please email me, david, at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. If you'd like to be a host interviewer on the show, grab your uh, mobile phone, uh, and tackle somebody you've met or that you know, sit down, and, and if you can record an audio file uh, and send it to me, maybe I can publish your episode as an episode on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. We have listeners now in more than 100 countries around the world, and I really would like to gather uh, a, a broader range of stories from people of all sorts of nationalities and backgrounds. So if you want to do something like that, feel free to drop me a line. I'm happy to help you prepare, give you some advice. Uh, or just simply write down six to ten questions that you'd like to ask that person and before you know it you will have filled up an hour having an interesting conversation so if you record that on your mobile device create an audio file send that to me then that's usually enough for me to be able to, to, be able to publish that uh, try to block, block out background noise chatter uh, try to avoid windy situations and that type of thing and pretty much I can work with that so if you'd like to help me publish an episode uh, by being a guest host on the show feel free to try your hand at having an in- interesting conversation with somebody interesting that's doing something in the world of sailing folks thank you and I'll catch you at the next episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast and by the way remember to check out oceansailingpodcast.com with links to various websites and show notes of all of these people that I'm talking to about all these interesting things that they do thank you and see you next time I painted a picture of I picture cold dark sand and skies I painted the future how it's supposed to be With warm sun and a bright town So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them Watching some getting ready to